I'm Jess Lipschitz. I'm going to be reading a bit from Dr. Goldie Mohammed's Cultivating Genius. I'm starting on page 65. Cultivating Identity. When I work with teachers who struggle with teaching culturally and linguistically diverse youth, I often ask them to tell me about their students. Sadly, I'm usually flooded with negative responses and comments about perceived weaknesses of the students in their schools and classrooms. In response to my question, I first hear things like, my students don't like to read or write. My students can't read. My students aren't invested in their learning. My students' test scores are low. My students are unmotivated. I have many reactions and tensions around such comments. For one, I have never met an unmotivated child in my years working with youth. I have, however, met unmotivating curriculum and instruction. Secondly, I unpack the use of the phrase, my students, and why teachers felt that students in their classrooms somehow belonged to them when they talk about them with such disparaging comments. I wonder if they would introduce their own children to strangers in similar ways. If not, why are we still othering children? This very problem prompted Lisa Del Pitt, 2006, to write her book, other people's children, cultural conflict in the classroom. She writes about how some educators do not teach diverse students as their own and how the notion of othering marginalizes them. This practice is in direct conflict with cultural and historic responsiveness. I also recently had teachers tell me that after they got tenure, they had the choice to go back to teaching in very rote, unresponsive ways because they had more job security. I pushed back on this comment because for Black educators and others who see children of color as their own people, they don't see going back to mediocrity as a choice because it will be a failure for our people we don't separate the progress of Black children as an example from the progress of our own people. If we flip this notion of other further, we are actually teaching other people's curriculum in schools because current curriculum and standards are not typically written with our students' identities in mind, especially Black and Brown children. Most sanctioned curriculum is not our own. Curriculum today, including the Common Core State Standards, is not able to address meaning making shaped by student identity. Moreover, the curricula, books, and mandated frameworks used across the nation are not usually designed for Black and Brown children, and these are the youth populations who have been underserved by education the most. These educational mandates are not normally written by educators and researchers of color. If we seek to get it right with populations that have been underserved by schools the most, a productive starting point must be to put sanctioned curricula in place designed by people of color for youth of color so that all educators and all children can achieve. If we seek to advance the educational development of youth, we must create frameworks that are written in response to their histories and identities. When I ask teachers to tell me about the students in their schools and classrooms, I began to notice where they started students' stories. Some teachers' comments did not always reflect excellence and brilliance. Now, there are always the exceptions, teachers who rave about how wonderful, talented, and bright their students are. But we must challenge those teachers who judge their students from a deficit perspective. I ask teachers to close their eyes and think of their own shortcomings or faults. I ask them to consider that one thing they may have done in their past that they want to forget about, the thing that they hope to keep hidden due to embarrassment. I asked if they wanted someone else to introduce them to a group of strangers in this same way. They typically replied no. This all relates to where we begin our students' stories and who they are. We must start their stories and identities with their excellence.